Welcome to our forum on ballot question two, asking Massachusetts voters whether they'd like to expand the number of charter schools in the state. My name is Jeff Good. I'm executive editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette and its sister papers, the Recorder of Greenfield and the Valley Advocate. I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight. One, one important housekeeping note to begin with, if you have cell phones, please silence them or turn them off. Uh, so that everybody here can hear the debate without uh, your amazing ringtone chiming in. <laughs> I'd like to thank tonight's sponsors, the awesome journalism department at UMass, WHMP Radio, League of Women Voters, Northampton Community Television, Greenfield Community Television, and the Gazette Recorder and Advocate, um, who are also sponsoring this debate. We've been partnering in this event with, with Professor B.J. Roach's multimedia journalism class, so all these talented students you see running around tonight are part of, are part of her squadron, and it's really wonderful to have them here participating in a, in, a, in a very important exercise in democracy. Mark Dunphy, one of the students, will be reading the ballot question for us in a moment. And Julie Shamgochin will give a brief, pr brief presentation of the history of charter schools in Massachusetts before we get started. Uh, this proposed law would allow the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to approve up to 12 new charter schools or enrollment expansions in existing charter schools each year. Approvals under this law would expand statewide charter school enrollment by up to 1% of the total statewide public school enrollment each year. New charters and enrollment expansions approved under this law would be exempt from existing limits on the number of charter schools, the number of students enrolled in them, and the amount of local school district spending allocated to them. If the board received more than 12 applications in a single year from qualified applicants, then the proposed law would require it to give priority to proposed charter schools or enrollment expansions in districts where student performance on statewide assessments is in the bottom 25% of all districts in the previous two years and where demonstrated parent demand for additional public school options is greatest. New charter schools and enrollment expansions approved under this proposed law would be subject to the same approval standards as other charter schools and to recruitment, retention, and multilingual outreach requirements that currently apply to some charter schools. Schools authorized under this law would be subject to annual performance reviews according to standards established by the board. The proposed law would take effect on January 1, 2017. A yes vote would allow for up to 12 approvals each year of either new charter schools or expanded enrollments in existing charter schools, but not to exceed 1% of the statewide public school enrollment. A no vote would make no change in current laws relative to charter schools. Charter schools are independent public schools that cooperate under five-year charters granted by the Commonwealth Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. The schools are usually proposed and run by members of the community, parents, teachers, or nonprofit organizations. Charters emerged in Massachusetts as part of the Education Reform Act of 1993. In 1995, the first four charter schools opened in Boston, Massachusetts, enrolling 785 students. In 2000, the cap on charters was increased from 25 to 120 total. In 2010, as a result of the Achievement Gap Act, the state increased the cap again. According to the Massachusetts Department of Education, 60 of the 78 operating charter schools are urban, while the remaining 18 are suburban or rural. The Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation states that 4% of the state's public school students attend charter schools. Currently, there are 43,648 enrolled students and 32,600 on the initial wait list. Charter schools are concentrated in low-performing districts, according to the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation. Some schools also address specific educational goals or student demographics. An example is the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School in Hadley, Massachusetts. They focus on cross-cultural success based on Chinese language and culture. The, the Veritas Preparatory Charter School, located in Springfield, Massachusetts, focuses on preparing students in grades five through eight for their future academics. As public schools, charters are funded with public money. There is disagreement about whether charter schools take away funding from other public schools. 
The Department of Education recently found that in 2007, the percent of reimbursement to districts was 100%, and now, in 2016, it is only 62%. Currently, about 33,000 students are on waiting lists for charter schools around the state. This question seeks to increase the number of charters in part to serve that population. Thank you, Julie and Mark, nicely done. Now I'd like to, to introduce you to our moderator for tonight, Eileen Stewart. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, welcome to all of you. It's great to see so many people here tonight. And um, we can hope that this doesn't fall down too soon. Here we go. Um, I, I also want to welcome everyone who is watching on uh, Northampton Community Television, Greenfield Community Television, or via the Gazette and Recorder websites, that's gazettenet.com and recorder.com. And um, for those of you who might miss something scintillating, don't worry, you can catch up with it because WHMP will be broadcasting this program in its entirety tomorrow night from 7 to 9 p.m. And you can tune into them at 96.9 or 107.5 FM. I think you also still have your AM station, right? 1400? Mm -hmm. Yeah, here we go, do the Red Sox. That's how I used to catch them. Okay, the forum tonight is on a subject which is vitally important to us, namely the education of our children. This is our future. So the organizers have tried to develop a format that, for tonight that will offer the maximum opportunity for all of us to learn something that will help us make an informed vote. Here is the format. We have a panel of experts and we're very delighted to have them here and thank them for their time. Each of them will make a statement about his or her point of view, statement lasting two minutes only, and then they will take questions from our media panel and we're delighted to have them here tonight. And they will also take questions from you in the audience. Um, I think many of you already got a card and a pencil that you can use to write down your question. Um, let me just say that if you have, and you have a question at any time, if you have it now or if you have it at any time, pass it to the center. And our great helper, Brooke, right here. Raise your hand, please, Brooke. There we go. We'll come along and collect them for you. Um, and she will deliver them to our interlocutors who are sitting down here from the journalism de department. They will ask their que your question for you. Um, and the reason that they're going to do that is because they have the microphones and we can hear them. So, <laughs> Now, I want to ask you earnestly, if you're using paper and pencil, please, please write or print legibly. If we can't read them, oh, we can't ask them. Okay. And uh, for those of you who have your devices opening or who are following us online, you can also ask your question via Twitter, hashtag MAForumQ2. It's right up there, right? MAForumQ, the numeral two. Okay, let me introduce our panels, please. To my right, our panel of experts, and we have, first of all, Barbara Mattaloni. She is the president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. Next to her is Mr. William Deal, and Mr. Deal is the executive director of the Collaborative for Educational Services. And to his right is Mr. Mark Kennan. Mr. Kennan is the executive director of the Massachusetts Charter Public Schools Association. And following up, uh, to his right is Ms. Julia Mejia. And Ms. Mejia has three children in charter schools in Boston. To my left is our media panel. We have Stanley Moulton from the Gazette. We have Stephanie Slish, who is from WHMP. We have Serena McMahon. She is a junior here at UMass, and she is double majoring in journalism and gender, women's studies, gender studies, and sexuality. Some version of those three. Okay, and next to her is Kelsey, just Kelsey McMahon. I'm sorry, Kelsey Kenny. Kelsey, I thought you were sisters. No, Kelsey Kenny, she is also a junior and also a double major in journalism and legal studies. So, um, we will begin, as I, <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned, with a brief statement uh, from each of the of the uh, our panel of experts. It's two minutes, and they will then have questions from 
the media panel when they finish the, with that up. The experts will then have three minutes to answer those questions, and there's an opportunity for a one-minute rebuttal. So if Ms. Mataloni says something Mr. Cannon doesn't agree with, she gets three minutes, and he gets one minute, and vice versa, if he goes first. Now, you will remember that one of the sponsors tonight is the League of Women Voters. The League has not taken a position on question two, but they have been busy with their excellent work of research, uh, education, and efforts to get out the vote. They're also professional timekeepers. And uh, I don't think you can see them up there, but they have signs, you know, and they hold them up, you know, three minutes, two minutes, <laughs> one minute, stop now. So. Without further ado, I just want to say, the league is watching. <laughs> you can, we're going to begin, and we're going to go alphabetically. So first we will hear from Mr. William Deal. Mr. Deal. Good evening. I'm Bill Deal. I'm the exec executive director of the Collaborative for Educational Services in Northampton. Like 25 other collaboratives in the Commonwealth, we provide a range of special education services for low instance populations, professional development, after school programs, early childhood programs, and many other services. We have 36 member school districts, almost all the districts in Franklin and Hampshire County, almost all rural and urban, rural and small, and we also work with the Berkshires and other districts as well. We also provide the education throughout the state for all the youth who are part of the Department of Youth Services youth who are incarcerated, as well as youth who are in DMH, Department of Mental Health, Department of Public Health, and County Housing Correction. In other words, we serve the youth and children who are most at risk of failure and most at risk of being failed by the system. I mention these two things because I'd like to focus tonight on those that are often overlooked in the discussion about charter schools. Namely, first of all, the disproportionate impact of charter schools on our small and rural districts. And secondly, questions about serving the most vulnerable youth and children in the Commonwealth. I trust I will be asked about those things. I do want to say out front that this is a very complex issue. I recognize that people of goodwill, intelligence, and analytic skills who care deeply about education and children can end up on different conclusions about lifting the cap. It's unfortunate that a worthy debate about charter schools, indeed about the future of public education in the very state that founded the common school, is open to a referendum. With the results, whatever they may be, extremely hard to turn back. To my own family, I've been an educator all my life. My sister teaches in the Amherst Public Schools. My son taught at Mission Hill in Boston, then studied at Stanford with Linda Darlin Hammond, is now opposes charter schools. And my daughter sends her daughters, my two granddaughters, to one of the area charter schools. So our family discussions are very interesting. So I learned a long time ago when my kids were about 13 that I can't tell them anything, including what their opinion should be. So I try to be the wise father and not take sides, but recognizing the complexities, ambiguities, and nuances and pointing out different perspectives involved in this question. This is also the role I hope to play here tonight, neutral in the question, but bringing information and a different perspective to it. Thank you. Very close to two minutes. Thank you, sir. And uh, next we're going to go, sticking with our alphabetical um, form order, uh, Mr. Mark Cannon, please. Thank you, Eileen. Very happy to be here tonight. Um, I actually spent 15 years at UMass as a graduate student and professional staff, and so it's really nice to be back here tonight. This building wasn't here when I was here, um, but it's a beautiful building, so um, um, it's really great to be back on campus. Um, I noticed a lot of undergraduates in here. I'm sure a lot of you are here for classes and um, some kind of assignments, responsibilities. If you don't get your questions answered, at least from me um, tonight, please, I'll stay after, and happy to talk to anybody who has further questions, um, um, particularly undergrad students in the room. Uh, I want to talk my two minutes here. I want to talk about what this ballot question actually does. This ballot question, as Eileen read, or actually one of the students read, I'm sorry, that this question will lift the cap or allow up to 12 new charter schools a year with no more than 1% increase in the total number of students um, of the public education system in Massachusetts, which means a maximum of about 9,000 students a year. Now, this referendum question is focused entirely on our urban communities. This is not about suburbs. This is not about rural Western Mass. This is about cities in Massachusetts where children and families are struggling to get basic education needs met. Those of us in Western Mass have lots of choices for public education, whether it's charter um, public schools or district public schools or private schools. There are so many options here in Western Mass for us. I've raised four children in Western Mass um, to go a combination of all those kinds of schools. 
So we're very lucky out here, but there are many, many, many families who don't have that option. Living in Springfield, in Holyoke, in Boston, New Bedford, Fall River, Lawrence, Lowell. So while they, uh, the question allows, and you'll hear from Barbara say that the question allows charter schools to go anywhere in the state, anybody who looks carefully at the charter school movement will see that this is an urban movement. When charter schools started 20 years ago, it was statewide looking at all sorts of different communities. And we can talk about the Western Mass schools if somebody would like to. But this isn't about Western Mass in the, the Pioneer Valley. It is about Holyoke and Springfield. And we look forward to talking more about the needs of families that are not being met in Massachusetts and how this referendum question will provide equality and start to roll back some of the inequalities in our urban education systems. Thank you. Mr. Cannon, I'm going to move now to Ms. Barbara Madaloni. Ms. Madaloni. Good evening. Delighted to be here. Uh, I too am uh, from these parts and I'm a proud member of the Massachusetts Society of Professors, uh, the union here at uh, UMass Amherst, uh, the faculty union. Uh, I became a high school English teacher. I changed careers in order to become a high school English teacher uh, and I taught in Northampton because I believe deeply in public education as the foundation to democracy. I then went on to become a teacher educator here at UMass Amherst in order to uh, develop educators who could really commit to a social justice education and public education as the place that welcomes all students. I am profoundly opposed to this ballot question because it's, it has every possibility and potential of undermining public education here in Massachusetts, the birthplace of free uh, universal public education. Already in Massachusetts, we lose $450 million a year. Public schools goes into private hands in charter schools. If we were to increase the cap so that we could open 12 new charters anywhere in Massachusetts every year in perpetuity, within five years, that would be another $500 million in a system that's already underfunded by, by more than a billion dollars. Mark says this is only an urban issue. I say two things about that. First, already 230 districts lose money to charter schools. So this is not just an urban problem. Second. To the degree that this is an urban movement, I would ask you to consider that Black Lives Matter, Cambridge, came out against in, in opposition to question two, that the chair of our steering committee is the uh, president of the NAACP Northeast Regional Office, that the Boston City Council, the mayor, and the Boston School Committee are opposed to this, that 187 school committees are opposed to this, the M Mass Municipal, Association is opposed to this. This is not simply an urban issue. And just last week, NAACP National called for a halt in charter school, in the expansion of charter schools, as has uh, National Black Lives Matter. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Madaloni. We're gonna move along now to um, Ms. Mejia. Ms. Mejia. Please. So, good evening, everyone. I have to say first off that I always feel in these situations, mainly when it comes to defending my life, because this is what this work is for me, is personal and professional. I always feel lately that I am a Latina at a Trump rally, okay? So I just <laughs> wanna just put that out there really quick that mm -hmm. I am taking large um, courage to, to speak here on behalf of the countless parents that I work with and my own personal struggle in terms of trying to achieve um, equity in terms of public education because my story is is that I'm the first person in my family to graduate high school I'm the first person in my family to go to college I'm the first person in my family to rock a little business suit my mom did not even finish fifth grade so for me when I think about public education I think about it as a pathway out of poverty but unfortunately right because this conversation has become so volatile and so divisive we are forced to choose between one or the other. Families who are stuck without opportunities and can't afford to live in towns in which public education and your options are a plethora. Whereas if you live in Boston, unless you live in South End, Jamaica Plain, 
West Roxbury, these are all considered the more affluent parts of Boston, your chances of getting access to a high quality education is slim to none. And while for me, this conversation has always been about all, not just some, but we have to create a pathway out of poverty that puts children first and puts the adult conversations where they need to be. And that is adults owning their own and allowing this to recognize that at the end of the day, this conversation is about our kids. I have three kids, okay? And I'm going to do everything that I can to, and I'm gonna take 15 seconds, because I'm gonna finish like everybody else did. I am going to do whatever it takes to make sure that every single person who wants access and a choice to choose the type of education that they believe is best suited for their child gets it. Because this, for me, Black Lives Matters and the NAACP does not speak for me, because my kids are black and Latino. So for me, this person of color here has a whole different perspective when it comes to public education. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Mejia. We're gonna move now to um, questions from the panel and then we're going to be looking for questions from the audience. I would particularly love to hear uh, questions which elicit, uh, which are fact-based. And that's because there are a lot of facts which are unclear to me and I think to others. And, and also you can see it regularly in like the letters to the editor. So let's, uh, let's start here uh, with you, Mr. Moulton. Please begin. I'm sorry, no, no, I'm sorry. You know what, that was wrong. I just was looking down there, but in fact, Ms. McMahon volunteered to be first, and so go right ahead. Go ahead, thanks. The Commonwealth is capped at 120 charter schools. Right now, there are currently only 78 charter schools. What is the purpose of lifting the cap if we are not at the maximum number of charters? And did you want to direct that question to Mr. Cannon? Mm -hmm. Okay. And. Go ahead, sir, and then we can have a, a, a you know, rebuttal. So you get three minutes, go ahead. So there are a number of different kind of caps in Massachusetts. You cited the one that's 120 statewide, um, but there's a district cap on charter schools. And in our urban communities in Massachusetts, that district cap is at 18%. And that cap has been reached in Boston, Fall River, and Holyoke. And we're very close to that cap in Springfield, Lowell, New Bedford, Chelsea, Boston's at the cap. Yep. Um, so while we have schools available statewide, so we could open more schools in suburbs if we wanted to, we don't have the, any room under the cap, the district cap, to open more schools in these urban communities where families so desperately need options. That's why this question talks about giving priority to the lowest 25% performing districts in the state, none of which these communities around where we are right now are a part of. The only communities in Western Mass that are part of that lowest 25% are Springfield and Holyoke and Greenfield and Chicopee. Those are places where families need more options. In Massachusetts, in these gateway cities in Boston, which are the places where we are at the cap, over almost half of students in those cities are attending what the state calls underperforming schools. Half. And so all we're trying to do by this referendum is in those cities where families need those options so desperately to be able to offer a very modest growth. If we divided 12 schools a year among the 29 gateway cities, there's not much growth going on. It's not gonna be that we're going to take over a school district. There's a lot of scare tactics being talked about from the No on Two campaign, that we have some malicious intent to destroy a public school system. We're gonna to come to Amherst and open 12 schools in Amherst and take over the Amherst School District. No thank you. We're not going to be doing that. We are focused on the cities where families, not just black and brown, but also white students of low income are desperately looking for alternatives. This is not going to be anything drastic. 12 schools across the state in 29 communities. It's going to be very slow and to be honest with you, it's not going to meet the need completely. We have 32,000 students on wait lists, almost all of them in those urban communities. So we are focused on those communities, and so the statewide cap is not necessarily relevant. Okay, it looks like um, uh, Mr. Deal is, uh, yeah, okay, and he's <coughs> talked about it, and the microphone is over to you, Mr. Deal. You have a, a one-minute rebuttal. So I'm or trying response. to thread a needle here, but I'll do my best. So I just wanted to respond to, to Mark's uh, comments. The first thing is that there are, in fact, 12 districts, frankly, Hampshire County, that are lowest 25%, including Greenfield, East Hampton, a number of other ones. Secondly, the, ca the, the regulation, the uh, uh, law basically says to raise up to 12 schools a year, and if there are 12 or less, 
then so who are not in low poverty areas or low performing areas, the commissioner can approve other ones as well. So over the course of time, we can have more and more school, charter schools in suburban, rural, and small districts. So that's one area. The second area is that uh, over time, you have 12 schools a year, and sooner or later, you do reach a saturation point in the urban districts, and then where do the charter schools go? So we're opening a door potentially for a lot more charter schools in our small and rural districts, which can ill, can ill afford to have that competition. Okay, we're gonna go over now to uh, another question from our media panel. Um, okay, it's, it's to you, Kelsey. Everyone else is uh, looking down. Hi. <laughs> on the majority of guests on to uh, question funding comes from out-of-state corporate interests like the Walton family, owners of Walmart, and Michael Bloomberg. Um, my question is, what is, what is, uh, how are these out-of-state interests involved in questions you in Massachusetts, and why would they be investing so much money in this campaign? Um, okay, okay. okay, go ahead. Yes, please. So obviously this is a very important aspect of this campaign that I think is important for us to talk about. I've been the leading advocate for the charter school movement for the last 15 years. When we first started out, we were a small band of schools. There's a couple of leaders in the room who were part of that movement at the very beginning. 17 schools in the first couple of years, up to 25. And every year we had to fight for our lives against the attacks by the Massachusetts Teachers Association. Every year they fought in the legislature to limit our funding and our autonomies and to try to close us down. And every year we had to fight desperately for our survival. So after 15 years of this, when we really, at the last four years, we tried to be in the legislature to do where this should be doing done. This should not be part of a referendum, this question. This should have been done in the legislature. We tried two consecutive legislative sessions. Julie and I walked the, pay, walked the halls of the legislature consistently trying to get this bill passed, but the MTA blocked it. Mm -hmm. Two consecutive sessions. Four years we fought. And so now, when we have no choice left, if we want to be able to help these families, we had to go to a referendum. But if we went to a referendum by ourselves against the MTA, who recently voted to appropriate $9 million to this campaign, who has gotten $5 million from the National Education Association in Washington, then we would be run over. And so we view the donations we've received from both in-state and out-of-state supporters as leveling the playing field. These people have no interest in making profits off of charter schools. There's no money to be made off of charter schools. And I have to say, the heirs to Walmart, the Walton family, is not looking to make any more money off the charter schools in Massachusetts. It's just not happening. Walton and other of these funders have been in Massachusetts for almost 20 years supporting public education. They're not new to this battle. They've been here all along because they care about the kids in urban communities just like we've been talking about. Do I have some issues with some of them? Of course. But in, ter in terms of drafting public policy, you can't just be able to handle, hang out with all those people who you feel most comfortable with or most agree with you. If you want to make change in society, you have to build bridges to other groups that you may not necessarily agree with all the time. And the alliance that we've drawn between black and brown families in Massachusetts who are striving for more charter schools and some of these donors from in-state and out-of-state to support our effort is a groundbreaking effort and is hopefully going to lead to some significant change for these families who are struggling for a basic public education. All right, Ms. Madaloni, over to you, please. Uh, quite frankly, I'm incredulous. Uh, so, um, f first of all, uh, referencing legislation, uh, Mark uh, was quoted uh, around the RISE Act, which the Senate proposed last year, that would lift the cap on charters and bring accountability measures to charter schools as saying that that was outrageous and that we couldn't have local control and we couldn't require things like teachers to be certified. So just sort of move that aside. And then I just want you to ask you to think about the Walton family, which has brought so much to us in the form of Walmart and the way they treat their workers, that these are people who are interested in the well-being of children they don't even allow their employees to have the kind of schedules that they could send their kids to a charter school where parents have all kinds of requirements about where they have to be when and what they need to do. Last thing I want to say, and I have to say this, I am so proud to be the union leader for the Massachusetts Teachers Association, 110,000 members who every day get up and give all they can to the children of Massachusetts and put their money together to say, yeah, you know, 
know what? We're gonna fight to defend public education. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm gonna say, uh, it, it occurs to me, it occurs to me uh, that uh, so some of our panelists have, have been around this bush before, one or two times here. <laughs> Okay, and we will get to you. I'm gonna give you a pride of place to the next question, no matter what it is, Ms. Mejia. Okay, please. Ms. Slish, go ahead. Are Commonwealth charter school educators required to have the same credentials as public school teachers? And are they unionized? How is this model better or worse for students and teachers? Okay, so I will, I know I've been itching to talk. Y'all gonna be like, oh my God, this woman, all she wants to do is talk, but yes, I am going to take up my time here. Um, so I, I have some, a few things to talk about in terms of the, the, the union. One of the things that works for working families and single parents like myself is that I can drop my daughter off at school at 7.15 and I don't have to pick her up until 4.30. And my daughter is in an academic setting for eight hours while I work and I don't have to worry about whether or not she is safe. Right? So if you wanna talk about working for working families, what you wanna do is accommodate their needs. And sometimes you have to do that by extending the day. And then in terms of fighting for the kids, when I work, so I wanna be really clear in terms of who's fighting for who. There have been countless times when I've worked with parents who have their children in district schools where those, and not all teachers are alike, where some teachers are like, I'm going to get paid whether you learn or not type of attitude, and when we as parents want to push back on that system, we can't because the union protects the teachers, and that's what their job is, is to protect the teachers, but who's protecting our kids? And so for me, I have to push back on this fight because while I believe in teachers and I believe in unions, sometimes you have to really look at whether or not public traditional schools are really public because they're not really serving the public as they should. The fact is that I, survived the busing era in Boston, and that was 40 plus years ago. I know I look good for my age, but Absolutely. I will tell you this, I went through that, okay? And, and the fact that I'm still here having this conversation and now my kids are in the public system and we're fighting still, to me is embarrassing. And to know that when I graduated from high school, the only reason, and I dropped out and I went back, and no one even cared because my mom did not speak English, okay? so to be passed from grade to grade because I had an award-winning personality, to end up in college, okay? And having to realize that I had developmental math and English and that I was not prepared to compete with my college mates, that to me is an embarrassment. And that to me is still happening today. So you wanna talk about who's fighting for who? I'm here to behalf of those parents who want the best for their children but can't get it because we have to, every single day we have to fight against the contractual obligations of what we call the teachers union that prevents us as parents to get what we are looking for. Okay, we're gonna Actually, go, uh, Mrs. Madaloni, to you. Can I share, you like, can I share that quickly? Oh, so the union piece, absolutely. I think I already addressed it in terms of the way I, I talked about the unions. The unions are protecting the teachers and and in terms of credentials as far as from from what i know my daughter's in the first grade reading at a third grade level so in terms of credentials a piece of paper i don't know how much credential that could be but what i do know is that charter public schools the teachers also have to be licensed okay but they're not go, unionized okay we're, let's go let's go to Ms. we're going to divide our time here because we both have important pieces of information uh first of all uh, charter uh, school teachers are not required uh, to hold a license two the boston public school uh, btu the union there actually agreed to an extended day uh and, and meant to implement that uh, this year, an extended day, they were unable to because uh, the charter uh, schools refused to change the bus schedule uh, in order to do that. So the BTU union has agreed to that. We have extended day in Springfield. We have extended day in other districts. That is not something that is unique uh, to charter schools. But I think Bill has a point he wants to make. Do I get another minute or half? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, so I would like to say I, I appreciate your, all your statements and, the, and the, the work you're doing on behalf of your children. I think you're basically illustrating some of the major issues in Massachusetts. We, are the, we have the third largest achievement gap in the country. We have the second highest number of, of young people who are identified as special needs, and they primarily are African American, Latino, uh, second language learners, and so on. That's the problem. At the same time, we have been the highest ranking state 
in the nation on the APE, on the NAEP, National Assessment for Educational Progress, every single year since 2005. We are sixth in the, in the world, if we were our own nation, in reading on the international tests. And so we are also doing a superb job. Both these things are going on, and the question is, can we keep the high quality and, and address the inequalities? We have to do both things, and is charter schools the way to do it? I think that's really the main question in the uh, ballot initiative that we need to wrestle with. Okay, this certainly discussion so far is raising some amazingly uh, important and complex questions, and I hope you all are getting your questions down. Friends, do you, have you got some questions there? Oh yeah, they're nodding like crazy. Okay, we'll be with you in a minute. So don't forget paper and pencil or Twitter, okay? MA Forum to, Brooke, I got somebody asking for a card over there, please. Okay, she has a pencil already though, so we're good. Mr. Moulton, your turn for a question. I think the charter schools have done some innovations that are recognized and are can be lauded and are being shared with the public school districts. I think, I'm sorry, okay. is that better? Yeah. I think the extended school day is one example and the State Department of Education is supporting that in other schools as well, not just charter schools. Um, I think some of the innovations in terms of using the arts and cr other kinds of creativity in schools is basically taking hold. At the same time, the charter schools are in fact taking money from the school districts, uh, making them cut their art programs and cut other programs so they can't compete. So we have an issue here in terms of both the innovations that are coming forward and then the impact on public non-charter schools. Um, I will say that charter schools are supposed to present to and ch share their innovations with uh, the pu non-charter public schools, and they do that to varying degrees. I'm pleased to say that we had a conference this past weekend over so on social justice and equity, and we had teachers from two of our area charter schools present at that. I think that's a good example of charter schools participating in that kind of raising the knowledge level and, and the impact of all our schools. But I do think overall that they have not lived up to that particular mandate to the degree they, they could have or should have. Okay, we have a one time for a one minute response. Draw straws, okay, it's you Ms. Mejia. Okay, so I should have said earlier that I'm very passionate. And so I know although it might sound like I'm fighting, trust me, it's all from a good place and I'm not. I'm just very excited about this topic. So please don't be afraid of me. Um, seriously, I'm nice. Uh, so. Um, I wanted to, I, I'm glad that you acknowledge the fact that there is a lot of um, collaboration happening. I could only speak for Boston because that's the city in which I, I live in, right? So we have several charter public schools who have been working closely with our district schools. I'll give you an example of that. Neighborhood House, which is a charter school, um, been around for 20 years, has worked closely with the Mildred, which was a low-performing uh, middle school in Dorchester, and now they're level one. And that is a result of the collaborative work that's happening in terms of um, exchanging best practices, and I'm really excited um, to see that. In regards to uh, the level of um, accolades that Massachusetts has, that's awesome, but when you look at those numbers, that a lot of it has to do with the towns and, and the cities that have higher performing neighborhoods, you know, the neighborhoods that have access to wealth and opportunity. Those are the schools that are producing those results. Those are the schools that are helping us look good. But if you look at Boston and Gateway Cities, you're not gonna find those really great, um, you know, that's, that's, that's not what's helping us. And then the last thing that, that I wanna say, in terms of draining money, I find that to be so offensive. Listen, my kids are not thieves. They're not stealing money from public education. And whenever anyone says that my children are stealing, I find that to be offensive because I already feel bad enough coming in here asking for a handout. And this is not welfare cheese that we're talking about, folks. And we're not trying to open up crack labs. What we're trying to do is create access and opportunity for more families like mine and other countless families to have access to the type of opportunities and wealth that others have. Just correct that uh, I, I don't hear anyone say that your children were thieves. And I hope that's, I hope that's not the implication of the question. Um, so let me um, go now. We have some questions from the audience. Okay, our interlocutor is here. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Why don't you tell us who you are, sir? Uh, I'm Chris Marino. I'm a journalism and economics student here at UMass. And one of the 
question from the audience was, how do MCAT scores in charter schools compare to those of public schools? Well, that's a great question. Uh, Mr. Deal, is that a question for you, sir? <laughs> sure. <coughs> You being the identified I, 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 researcher? I think, yeah, yeah I, I think like all questions around charter schools, it's complicated, and I have to say that to start with. So I think overall the, the findings around charter schools, and Brookings Institute other institutes found this, was that in fact the charter schools are performing well in terms of MCAS, uh, performing, uh, performing public schools in many areas. Uh, at the same time, there are different questions in terms of admissions and retentions of students in charter schools that call into question. So let me just give you one example of that. Our public schools have to serve all comers. So let's take an example. Northampton is opening its schools to 51 new immigrants coming in January. They'll come in the door. They won't go to a charter school. They can't go to a charter school. They aren't there in time. Northampton will open their doors. They'll give them the tests. They will have the consequences of those tests. The same thing with uh, children who have interrupted schooling. Same thing with children who are second language learners. So we have a lot of incidents where our public schools are serving a somewhat different population, and in many cases a much more challenged population than our charter schools are. So the comparison really isn't a fair comparison. Okay, Mr. Cannon, I see you uh, checking your stats, so would you like to give a response, please? I'll let you take this one. Okay. <laughs> I, I think in this situation, you know, we can throw our, our opinions back and forth, but there's some really hard data now and studies that have been done. There have been studies done by Stanford professors, there's been two studies by Harvard professors, and a study by MIT professors, all showing that charter schools in our urban communities are outperforming other district schools in those communities. Is that the end all be all? No one here on this side of the table thinks that MCAS is the only objective um, evaluation of a charter school or any public school. We can talk about that, I think that's a different debate. Um, but under the, the rules that we operate under, we have shown that we are able to do for our kids what they need because out here in the suburbs and the affluent communities like Amherst, we can debate whether or not MCAS is a good thing, whether it's okay if, our, if, we, if we have MCAS being mandatory. But in urban communities, that's not an option to debate it. Those kids have to pass 10th grade MCAS. They have to. Whether or not we like it or not, whether we think as adults it's a cool thing or not to have MCAS, they have to do it. So we have no choice. And so we try really hard to provide those children with the education and the degree that they need in order to go on in their lives. Okay, let me just stop for a second here. I want to ask the tech folks, did you, are you getting the feed for streaming or did you need me to repeat the question? If you can repeat it, that would be Okay, I will from now on. And just to show that I'm not totally rigid, I will give Ms. <laughs> Mataloni one minute of response time too before she jumps yeah, out of the skin. I, 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 two points here. One is I, I really find it like profoundly unjust to say that uh, here in suburban communities, we actually don't have to think about MCAS scores, but we should be thinking about those and, and looking at uh, urban schools that way. When as an educator, you as parents and students know how much uh, high stakes testing uh, narrows our curriculum. It's not the kind of broad and rich curriculum that we want all our students to have and and to use MCAS scores as a way to say that charters are doing better and then to say but that doesn't really matter for suburban schools there's something deeply hypocritical about that the other the other piece of this that's really important is to, to pick up on Bill's point charter schools serve an entirely different population I have a report here that just came today from the Multicultural Education Training and Advocacy Association, which shows that the number of ELL students, English language learners, in our urban public school, uh, urban charter schools, is profoundly less than in our uh, urban public schools. And where they are, e are ELLs, those are uh, higher levels of fluency. And if I had another minute, I could tell you how deeply and um, profoundly special ed students are not being served in our charter schools, but they are always welcome when they come back to our public schools. L let me just say, um, for the benefit of our, of our audience here, this is really a complex a topic. And so one of the things that I would ask the panelists, and this is brand new to them, but I would really appreciate it if at the end you could just give us a couple of um, studies that you think you know, studies, data, that you think would be very helpful for people to try to make up their minds, because th there are, there's competing data here, and it's be important for us to kind of get a whole picture. Okay, and now, sir, your next qu the next question from the audience. Here we go. And you are. Hi, uh, my name is Henry Brecker, and I'm a journalism and political science student here at UMass. Uh, one question from the audience is uh, about teacher retention. Teacher retention is a concern for all public schools. 
Please explain the causes of especially high teacher turnover in your charter schools. Okay, and I have to uh, repeat this question just uh, for the feed, for the streaming. So the question is, um, could you talk about uh, issues of teacher retention in charter schools, which seems to be relatively high? Is that the question? Yep. Okay, very good. Um, who wants to start with that? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with because I can only speak from my own personal experience, and then I'll let Mark do the numbers and data and all that other stuff. So, so you're sharing your three minutes so, now. Yep, Here we go. Yep, yep. So my daughter's um, teacher is now in her ninth year at her charter school, um, and so I think that there's a, a myth in terms of the turnover. I mean, there might be some facts around it, but. I know from my own personal experience, my daughter's teacher has been there for nine years, and my other kids' teachers in the other school that I have kids in two different type of settings, their teachers have also been there for a long period of time. And what happens, and if, if I were a teacher, I believe because the day is so long, right? I'm going to assume that's probably, if anything, but the thing is, is the difference between our teachers and um, teachers who are unionized is that they have more flexibility and more autonomy around their curriculums. They are, they don't have to abide by the union contract. So their life, I see them, they seem to be happier to me. Okay, now we're gonna share, thank you. So I just wanna say, um, sort of talking back to the question about innovation. So what you're hearing tonight is a lot of different innovations that charter schools have been trying to do. So for instance, our teachers are not automatically unionized when they start out at, the, um, at charter schools. They can unionize, even a majority of the teachers at the school sign a card, even the privacy of their own home, they can unionize. They've all chosen not to. We've had one charter school right now that is unionized, and that's great if that's what the teachers wanted to do. They're not with the MTA though, they chose a different union, a non-teacher union to affiliate with. But the point of this is that there are lots of different models being used around the teaching force within the charter school community. And that's a good thing. For instance, the issue about certification, licensing. We are trying to create opportunities for teachers to come into the public teaching profession from lots of different avenues. Not just going from college to uh, in a college education program, doing your student teaching and going on to teaching. We're trying to open up so people from computer science careers, law careers, business careers, who are looking to try to give back to their community, change their profession, and can't afford to go back to college for a number of years, that they can move into the charter school without the traditional regulations that would prevent them otherwise. We're not saying this is the best way to do it. We're trying something new. And over time, we will be able to evaluate whether that's a good thing. Those of us in here who go through teacher training programs know it's not the end all be all. And having come from the college, the school of education here at UMass, our teacher education program, at least in those days, was not that great. So it's not the only way, it's not just one way of doing things in the public sector. And what we're trying to continue to do is open up people's minds, open up policy makers' minds to doing things, trying things different. And what's great about charters is the freedom we have, if they don't work, we can try again. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to have low teacher retention rates. That doesn't work in the interest of kids. But automatically having teachers with high retention rates, that are many teachers staying for 25 years, is automatically the best thing for kids. It's not about how many years you're there, it's about what quality you're providing mm -hmm. to the students there. And that's what we're trying to get a hold of and trying to look at, not how many years you've been there, how quickly you turn over, yep. but what's the quality of education going on for the kids in that school. Okay, Ms. Madaloni. Uh, a few different points. Uh, first, I'm, I'm fascinated by that we're just gonna try all this stuff out and we'll kind of see what happens. And while we're in the middle, like kind of trying it out, we'll go ahead and blow the cap up and we'll try it out in even more places and lose even more funds from our public schools to charter schools because we're just gonna kind of try it out, right? It's just an experiment on our children. Uh, but I want to, I would invite each of you to find a former charter teacher and I can promise you there are many of them in the Valley to talk about what it means uh, to not have a union contract. But I'll just kind of give you one example. Uh, Mystic Valley Charter School in Malden, uh, we were contacted MTA by two teachers who when they left Mystic Valley and they gave notice in April that they would not be returning in September, they, uh, Mystic Valley Charter School is now suing them for lost funds because they had to hire new teachers. As well, their contract says that they have non-compete clauses with surrounding districts. And in fact, we've been looking for contracts for charter teachers. We've only been able to find two, even though the Department of Ed's supposed to keep them all online. And they all have non they all have things that actually keep 
teachers from sharing information with other teachers. They're not supposed to share their knowledge. And this is about innovation. Okay, let's go to uh, one more question over there from our interlocutors, go ahead. Is it legible? Is that why you're frowning? Okay, okay, that's good. All right. If charter schools can offer better education for women's views, then can we expect an increase in quality gap in education from the expansion? Okay, it, if charter schools can go ahead, tell me again, please. If charter schools can offer better education for women's views, then can we expect an increase in quality gap in education from this expansion? Okay, so the question is, if charter schools can offer quality education for a limited few, can we expect the quality gap to increase if we increase the cap on charter schools? Um, wow, who wants to take it? Well, I think that's a really fascinating question, okay. so I'll just sort of jump in, because what it gets me thinking about is, um, if, you, if you go and look at, uh, and I have the numbers here in particular for Boston, at the, the size and scale of charter schools, um, so just open the page here to the Academy of the Pacific Rim, uh, which had 54 students in their, in their 12th grade. Now, there's a couple of things that's interesting about that 54. First of all, as a teacher, like to have 54 students in one grade uh, means that I'm gonna have incredible, so many more opportunities for, to have real meaningful relationships with those students. Uh, the other piece that's interesting about that is that in uh, at grade nine, that same cohort, actually had 79 students. So they started at 79 students and that they ended at 54. We go to Boston Collegiate, started at uh, 81 and ended at 57. So there is an issue here of scale uh, in, in terms of how small these classes are. And while they're having smaller classes, our class sizes are going up because we're losing funds to these charter schools and so we have to cut staff and then we have larger classes. So the issue of scale, I think, is a really, really important one. If we could have funding for every child to be in a class that small, things would be great. Small cl class size is really relevant in terms of the kinds of relationships that you can form. But while we're on that subject of scale, I actually think it's pretty interesting to look at the kinds of losses that you get from grade nine to grade 12 in charter schools. Uh, they're losing kids. And so to go back to the question of sort of MCAS and, and how well they do graduation rates, that's because they've lost sometimes 30, 40, 50% of the cohort that started in ninth grade. Uh, scale's an issue, uh, but I would say it's not even quite working at this level if they're losing that many students. Yeah. Ms. Mejia, go ahead. So I, I wanna be clear about one thing in terms of why sometimes kids leave charter schools. Oftentimes it's because, especially when they come into in the ninth grade, they're already performing at two to three grade levels below because they got passed from grade to grade in the K through eight setting, right? So when they come into a high school and the expectations are that kids are gonna know how to read and write, and we realize that they have been disenfranchised from K through eight because there's not a lot of accountability within that grade, then you have to wonder, right? If you're going to get kept back, oh hell no, I'm going back to the district school where they're gonna pass me because I don't have to worry about it. So let's be really honest that when kids leave, it's because they know that if they stay, they're gonna have to repeat the grade. Okay, so I just want you to know in terms of that little um, mass exodus. And then the okay, other- No, I, uh, I'm getting, I, know, I knew that little beep was coming. Wow, um, one more here and then we're gonna, right, the panel over here is getting ready to jump in. Go ahead, sir. Okay, so this tweet comes from uh, Caroline DeVito. Uh, is teaching tenure of current charter schools the same way it occurs in the public schools and does that have any effect on the teacher Question is, does teacher tenure occur in charter, school in the charter schools in the same way it occurs in other public schools and does that have any effect on the uh, rate of turnover? Uh, Mr. Cannon, did you wanna speak to that? Sure, you know, there's some people in the back room who are giving us thumbs down yeah. and stuff to us, and really it's rude, and so I wish you could stop. Yeah, we really appreciate it. That's, yeah, I'm feeling intimidated by all that. Stop bullying me, please, thank you. 
I'm sorry, the question was about... Um, the question was whether tenure operates in the same way for charter schools as it does in other public schools, and if so, what effect that might have on the rate of, um, of uh, retention for teachers? No, actually, teacher ch tenure is not the same in charter schools as uh, charter public schools as it is in many district public schools. Thank you. Want to go um, the mic there because, oh. yeah, yeah, thank you. And not just for loudness, but for, because it's streaming. So they need I understand. The, the question of teacher retention and teacher tenure obviously is a really important one, but again, I need to come back to the question, and those of you who are undergraduates deal with this around teacher tenure at the university. Teacher tenure is not the end all be all either. There are many teachers who have teacher tenure who shouldn't be teaching anymore, whether it's in K-12 or in higher education. Mm -hmm. And teacher tenure protects teachers who are not performing well. On the other hand, teacher tenure, both especially in the higher ed level, but also K-12 level, protects teachers from retaliation against them by administrative forces that are not um, having teachers and kids in their best interest. So we understand the value of teacher, ten teacher tenure, um, and it's a controversial issue within the charter school community. So we want to figure out a way to be able to keep the best teachers for as long as they want to be with us, but not be bound by tenure to keep teachers who are not performing well. So it's a complex issue, and we understand why it creates um, interesting conversation. We have no chance to speak as well, so hey, Mr. Deal, okay. over to you. I want to say uh, just a couple things in response. Uh, the first one is a previous statement that was made. I think one of the most interesting and I think hypocritical things that DESE does is they have set up a, a very, very strenuous teacher preparation program, uh, re, re, uh, requiring teachers to have a lot of professional development points to continue their certification. Really have been very, very, set a very high bar for teachers. And at the same time, they allow charter schools not to have that same bar. So either that's the right bar for improving public education or it's not. I think that's a bit of a dilemma that they don't do both ways. Now, in, in terms of this, this specific, um, area, I, I think that uh, we, I mentioned before that our schools are the top in the nation on the Ape, NAEP. We're sixth in the world uh, in reading on international studies. I think if this conversation becomes a conversation that denigrates our excellent teachers and schools in the Commonwealth, everybody's a loser. So I think we need to step away from that conversation about what teachers don't do, the bad teachers. They are, do exist, they are there, but overall, I think by any measure, we have the best schools and the best teachers in the nation and probably in the world. And, and, and we're can, fully can, unionized, and the best schools, in the, the states with the best schools are states with unionized teachers. Finland is unionized. The unions make for stronger teachers and stronger okay. schools. Okay, I wanna, just, um, just before we, uh, we go to the, our next question, I just wanna uh, clarify, DESE is not uh, a medication, right? You're talking about the de State Department of Education? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you, all right. So, <laughs> so your, like that, that's your, your point <laughs> is that they have the State Department of Education has two very different standards for teacher education for right. public schools and charter public schools. Okay, let's take one more from the audience and then we're gonna go to the panel. I know you're ready for more questions. Here we go. Oh, I guess a lot came in. Okay, it's getting, okay, it's getting hot. All right, then while you're sorting through them, no, oh, okay, <laughs> don't, go ahead. All right, the question is d d specifically the question on the ballot, right? Yes. Does it mean that schools cannot spend more than 9% on charter schools? Is that what you're saying? Is that what the question is? Okay. Simple answer. The ballot question says that there is no limit to the amount that any one district could spend on a charter school. So one of the concerns about this, even though you hear the numbers 12 and 1, the 12 new charters, 1%, any one district could have all 12 of those schools. Mm -hmm. and, 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 that, and because there'd be no, the cap, the, it's actually the most significant cap in some ways that's being exploded in this question is the cap on the amount of money that the district would be able to, uh, would, would have to send to the charter school. 
Uh, Mark said before, like there's no idea here that this is, we're gonna take over schools. Well, the fact of the matter is that nationwide, we've seen uh, districts go over to charter schools. New Orleans Parish now has, uh, I think it's only about 4% of their schools are charter school, are, are public schools. They've been charterized. Uh, Los Angeles County, 35% of their schools are, are charterized. Uh, it, when we talk, go back to the idea of, of who's putting the money into the yes question, and, and Mark has decided that he's okay dealing with, with the Waltons and, and, and Bloomberg, who are uh, two of the uh, like top 20 richest people in America, um, that, they, that they have our best interests. They are also putting money into initiatives like this across the country. They're putting money into candidates who are gonna push this charterization and privatization of our public schools across the country. This is part of a broader corporate assault uh, on our schools, and, and that question gets right to it. You can blow up a district. You get rid of Holyoke, in one year, they'd all be charterized. Springfield, we think, would be about three years. Boston, about five. Don't think that it can't happen, because it has happened, and it's happening across the country. It's nothing in the ballot question that says, oh, by the way, you're not allowed to blow up our schools. So, all right, Ms. Mejia, yeah, I yes. see you have a grip on that microphone. My Go Lord. ahead. Okay. I hope I'm entertaining you all this evening too. So I, I, I have some concerns and some questions about this whole situation. Like as a parent, for me, I can care less if it's a district or a charter, right? So it's about governance structure, right? I think that what happens is that people have this idea that there's only one way to educate and only one system that should be operating. I believe that the charter public school movement is really about another, uh, looking at education, public education as a bigger strategy in terms of how they fit into that landscape. So it's not to say that charter public schools are the end game of public education, but they definitely are a great solution and provide a lot of families with another alternative, right? So no one's trying to charterize the nation. Good Lord, that would not be a good look, Barbara. Um, I think that one of the things that we also need to look at is that I, it's difficult for me to hear you say that because for me, all I can hear is that this is about protecting jobs and not thinking about the kids. And so I don't understand what, why, why the opposition um, to give parents the type of environment that they're seeking for their kids. Why are you so opposed to giving people that right? As a parent, do you have any kids in the system? I mean, do you really understand what's at stake here for families? Okay, you know, I think that's actually a, a very in, uh, interesting question. I will uh, ask Ms. Mataloni to, to uh, uh, answer it later or to respond to it later, even if the question that she's asked is something different. You might, I can see you wanna answer that one. But let's go over to our uh, panel here, our media panel. They've been waiting and patient. Go ahead. The question is how, do, how does public school choice and charter schools, going to a charter school differ? So, right, so you have schools choice you can choose to go to a... Right. Uh, okay, it, it, go ahead. Very, very different, and this, this really in some degree speaks to one of my passions, which is the impact of charter schools on small and rural districts. So in Franklin, Hampshire County, we have choice on ster steroids. 12% of the kids in Franklin County, 8% in Hampshire County, choice out of their districts in another district. That means that they choose, for example, a Northampton student chooses to go to Hatfield. $5,000 follows that student to Hatfield. A Hatfield student might decide to go to Amherst. $5,000 follows that student. And they're winners or losers. Some districts lose a lot of money to choice and some gain. It turns out, of course, that the ones who lose the most are the ones who are viewed the poorest, who tend to then perform the poorest. It's a downward spiral. But that's a pretty cut and dry thing. And the $5,000 is arrived at by saying, what's the incremental cost of educating one student? That is reasonable, I think. Now, on the other hand, if a charter school, if a student from Northampton goes to one of the charter schools here, the district will pay $14,000. Um, and that is of significant more, and it's not just the money following the student, it's a lot more than that. So it's a very different thing in that regard as well. Um, the other thing that happens in our, if I may digress a little bit, in our region, we have the highest percentage of homeschooled kids in the, in the state. Uh, we have a high percentage of kids going to uh, private schools and parochial schools. So overall, we, and we also have a shrinking enrollment. Uh, so overall, we have a, 
a perfect storm here where the schools are hurting badly because they lose enrollment and the students who are in the schools are choosing to do all kinds of other things and opening additional charter schools in this case doesn't make any sense and in fact this this particular uh, dynamic would allow uh, more charter schools in our small and rural districts so I think school choice is actually an interesting conversation because we do have a lot of school choice in Massachusetts. And you know, particularly I find um, troubling the city of Northampton and the school district of Northampton who spends a lot of time critiquing charter schools. There's a lot of activity coming out of um, the city of Northampton about charter schools. But then, but city of Northampton is making a lot of money off of school choice. The city of Northampton last year gained $1.2 million from incoming student, the, the balance, you took, they lost 83 students and they gained 221 students for a total of about $1.2 million profit for the city of Northampton. Where are, those city, where are those kids coming from? They're mostly coming from East Hampton. And so East Hampton, which we talked about before, according to Bill, has slipped into the lowest 25% performing districts. It was, but... So they have, they last year, they received 86 kids in school choice, but they lost 175 kids for a deficit of almost $600,000. So those $600,000 are going from East Hampton to North Hampton. But the city of North Hampton doesn't seem to care about that. It's okay for them to take money and kids from the next town over in East Hampton, but it's not okay for charter school students to leave North Hampton City um, High School or North Hampton to go to a charter school. All of a sudden, this is a big problem. I do need to respond, if I may. I, yeah, I just have dual, I think we're going to have a case of dueling data here. Go ahead, Mr. Deal. So, so for, first of all, I agree with you that, that the uh, issue of school choice is kind of a devil's deal. I think it, they're winners and losers. We have districts in, in our, our county. Uh, that basically have more than 50% of the kids' school choice kids. If they lost those kids, those schools would be dead. I mean, they've made a devil's deal here, and I, I agree with that. But let's talk about the facts. So Northampton, fiscal year 16, paid $2,359,000 for charter school tuition, and that accounted for 201 students. They paid $10,384 on average per student to charter schools. On the other hand, in terms of school choice, uh, they sent out 84 students, uh, they brought in 84 students uh, for a total of 1,829, uh, 7,587 per student. So major difference between the charter school and the school choice numbers. I think okay. that's important to note. So school choice was in place before the big charter school movement. It was an effort to provide parents with more choice. The superintendents in, North, in Franklin Hampshire County will tell you we have choice on steroids. Okay, um, before we get too deeply into the weeds on this one, um, I think I, I, I can see the two of you looking at each other's statistics. That's a good thing. Maybe we'll come to some agreement or at least some <laughs> understanding here. Let's go to a couple more questions from our panel. Um, according to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, it is projected that Boston Public Schools will receive approximately $1.5 billion in federal funding through the Boston Public Schools Investment Program. Um, Thank you. Um, oh, wow, question directed to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I think I said it earlier in terms of taking money. So as the uh, last time I remember, I am a Massachusetts resident. I pay taxes. I live in the city of Boston. And therefore, those dollars really also belong to me, and I'm a taxpayer. So how I choose to utilize my dollars is a matter of choice, right? So I hear the argument that my choice impacts a, another child's choice, but when my daughter hears that her neighbor, because she's in a charter school now, her neighbor does not have access to X, Y, and Z, that really is an issue around management and how you decide to utilize the billions of dollars that Boston Public School gets because we're talking about a one point, I don't know how many billion 
is the operating budget for Boston Public Schools, but unfortunately, that one point however billion dollars does not come into our classrooms, right? Because your budget is a value statement. And if those dollars are not getting into the classroom, then the question is, what can the school committee do? What can the city of Boston do? And what can those who have control of those dollars do to ensure that that one point however many billion dollars gets allotted into those classrooms. So it's not really about the charter public schools taking away, it's really about how Boston Public School decides to utilize their dollars. It's a value statement and when you look at it, and I don't know the facts and figures because I'm not one of those numbers folks, but I will say and what I heard, and Mark I'm sure you will correct me if I'm wrong, is that 70% of that one point, I don't ever know how many billion dollars, goes to salaries and pensions. Okay, I'm gonna let that sink in there for a quick second. And a very small portion of that goes to educating our kids. So what we need to do is hold our district schools accountable to how they utilize those dollars and be, um, and, and I wouldn't say, with a fine tooth comb maybe, that's what is needed on that side to ensure that those dollars are being used accordingly. Ms. Madaloni, go ahead. I invite you to go ahead and let the salaries and pensions sink in. That's pain uh, for the work of working people uh, who go in every day and take care of the, uh, and, and work to educate and, and, and care for, care deeply uh, for the young people of Boston. Uh, every working person uh, should have the protection of the union that would afford them uh, a decent salary, a decent pension, Absolutely. and different, decent health care. Uh, and that, that's something that, that we're all working for. Uh, but the other piece that, that I just want to speak to here, um, in terms of the issue of choice and sort of my taxpayer dollars, that's a, um, I'm reminded of uh, uh, the book Savage Inequalities, um, in which he writes about uh, sitting, uh, he, it's, a, it's a book about uh, schools in, in high poverty districts. And, and uh, he, he spends, he's, he's, an, he's an elitist, right? So he has, he has dinner with his elitist friends. And he, and he talks about having dinner. Oh, um, and his friends uh, who are sending their kids to, to schools that cost $25,000, $30,000 a year say, you know, m money isn't the issue in, in uh, urban schools. It's just how they spend the money. <coughs> and he says he's ready to jump out of his skin because of course money's the issue. Our best private schools cost $50,000 a year. I want every child in Massachusetts to have that opportunity, and we're not going to get it through charter schools. We're not going to get it through charter schools. We're going to get it through fully funding public education, and we're going to have to tax the rich to do that. When? Okay, okay. We we've got, been uh, waiting we for 45 years, gentlemen, years for just that. Just a minute. Just a minute. Excuse me. Just a minute. We got. Um, we got uh, uh, a time called here. And the other thing I have to say up there: uh, no sticks. If you have a sign, no sticks. Take the sign off a stick, please. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh -huh. You've been waiting, I can tell that. You've been waiting. Go ahead, Stephanie. Uh, Ms. Melanie touched on this in an earlier question, but charters have been criticized for having fewer of the, quote, difficult students, meaning fewer severely special needs students, fewer English language learners, and fewer behaviorally destructive kids, um, and higher disciplinary rates. Is it true that really hard cases are more likely to end up in traditional schools, and how does this happen? Can, can you repeat the question? I miss who heard <coughs> yeah. We're gonna have this the, the end of it. I just want oh. the end of it. Um, is it true that really hard cases are more likely to end up in traditional schools? And how does this happen? Sure, I mean, I have good numbers here. Great. We can, we'll, Bill and I will, will share this. Um, but we'll just share. sort of the most recent numbers, if you look at the Boston Public Schools in terms of number of special education students, 47% uh, of the Boston Public Schools are in what's called full inclusion classes. So their level of special needs allows them uh, to uh, be in, in classrooms with uh, re uh, regular ed students. 11.6 uh, are in partial inclusion classes and a full 33.3% are in uh, uh, substantially separate classrooms. So 33.7% of the, of the Boston Public Schools are substantially separate and 49%, 45% uh, require some high intensity special needs. Uh, if we look at the numbers, then uh, go to charter schools, Boston Collegiate, I was on a, in a debate with the head of uh, Boston Collegiate, um, only 
of their students are in either partial inclusion or substantially separate inclusion. Uh, and that's actually a lot relative to, say, the Academy of the Pacific Rim, Rim which has 15% or the uh, Alma Damar Charter School, which has 2.6% of their students in partial uh, inclusion and the other 97% are uh, full inclusion. So what we see there is that the special needs students, uh, even when they have special needs students in charter schools, they don't have the same level of need. Uh, what we know is that when they do have substantial needs, uh, they are counseled out. Uh, we are looking at data right now that shows the incredibly low percentage of certified special education providers in charter schools. Some that might have somebody who's there for four hours a week. And what we hear from parents over and over again, parents who love their children deeply and care about them, is they get called into rooms to say, you know, we've been looking at your IEP and we're not gonna be able to provide those services, so you're gonna have to go back to the public school. And you know what's the best part of that story? We welcome them back and we work with them because that's what it means to be a public school is to welcome every child and work with every child, even those ones in ninth grade who have struggled to read and leave the charter school. They come back to our 10th grade classes. I've had them in my class. We learn how to read, we learn how to write, we learn how to become citizens of this democracy. Um, I'm gonna ask Mr. Cannon to respond to that just a second. But um, before we do, I have a question that's twice We've referenced the uh, School of the Pacific Rim, but isn't it actually on the Atlantic Rim? <laughs> no, I'm just asking. Is, 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 Trick question. Okay, never mind. Um, if, I, if I could use the 30 seconds remaining. Oh, there's 30 seconds, yeah. that's right, there were. Go so, ahead so and I then to to I'm gonna the, give Mr. Cannon at least two minutes yeah. to answer this. So there's okay. one other segment of special needs students, and that's students who are not served in their local schools. These are, these are uh, students who are, have significant disabilities, and they are bu basically transported elsewhere for very intensive work. So the state has a way of helping protect districts from that. They have what's called a circuit breaker. So a circuit breaker comes into effect after there's a certain amount of funds that a district pays for students. Now in the entire state, the number of charter school students who take advantage of circuit breakers is five out of four schools. So these are significantly disabled kids because basically once, once they're identified that way, they become the responsibility of the sending public school. Just to give you a quick example, the circuit breaker is such that if a SPED student costs a district $75,000, which many of them do, uh, the state reimburses 42,000 and the school pays 32,000. That's 32,000 the local city plays that a charter school never sees. So there is a differential here that automatically occurs. So um, Eileen, you asked for us to identify data and studies to help yes, our yes. students, and, and especially again, in the yeah. room and online. So let me um, share two studies, if I may, with Please. you. The first one is a study done by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education released in 2014 about special education in district schools in Massachusetts. Some of the findings that came out of that study. There are substantial differences in the identification, placement, and performance of low-income and non-low-income students with disabilities. Low-income students were identified as eligible for special education services at substantially higher rates than non-low-income students. Among students enrolled in traditional public schools, low-income students with disability were educated outside of the general education classroom at rates substantially higher than non-low-income non-low-income students. Students with disabilities who had full inclusion placements appeared to outperform similar students who were not included to the same extent in general education classrooms than non-disabled peers. For people on this table, I mean, with all due respect, Bill, for the pointing fingers at charter schools about how we deal or don't deal with special education feels like a travesty. We all know that the special education system in, in, our, in the American um, public education system and in Massachusetts, the best education system in the country, is really lacking. So to contrast that, a study done in November 2015 by an MIT researcher named Elizabeth Cetrin, special education and English language learners in Boston charter schools. I'll just read her abstract. This is a quote. The questions of whether and how well charter schools serve special education and English language learners remains one of the most controversial topics in the charter school debate. This study uses admission lotteries to estimate the effects of Boston's charter school enrollment on student achievement and classification of these special needs students. Charter attendance, going to charter schools, effects on test scores are positive and similar 
for special needs and non-special needs students. Charters also increase the likelihood that special needs students meet high school graduation requirements and earn a state merit scholarship. Even the most disadvantaged special needs students benefit from charter attendance. Charter schools also, and this is critical, remove special needs classifications and move students into more inclusive classrooms mm -hmm. at a substantially higher rate than traditional public schools. Yep. Differences in charter classification practices are largely unrelated to charter gains, suggesting that special needs classification is not essential for disadvantaged students to make progress. Okay, we're gonna go now to some more uh, questions from the audience, please. And uh, wait, but, but Stan, Mr. Moulton, I don't wanna leave you out. Did you have a question you want to ask? Uh, well, I might know why I said that. Yeah, you always do. Go ahead then. We'll finish up with you and then, then we'll go to audience questions. Go ahead, sir. I agree with you completely, and so I have to say that the, the MTA has received one contract sample from Mystic Valley Regional Charter School in Malden, and I have to say that our association represents 69 out of the 70 Commonwealth Charter Schools in Massachusetts, and it's not Mystic Valley. They are the one, or one school that is not a member of our association, and I do not defend that practice that you cited, and I certainly do not defend them suing teachers who have left the school, and that is why they're not part of our association because of the practices that they employ. Mm. If I could just okay. add, it, it was not just Mystic Valley, but there was one other school, and as I said earlier, the, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed is required to publicly uh, to, to, uh, put up the contracts for charter school teachers uh, across the Commonwealth. We could only find two. Uh, one was uh, from Mystic Valley and uh, the other is escaping me, I'd have to look. Uh, and we've actually put out FOIA requests, Freedom of Information requests, uh, to charter schools so we can find out what's in these contracts and are there other non-compete clauses. We don't know because the department isn't doing their job to let us know and collect those contracts. Okay, we're gonna go for some questions from the audience and when we come back from that, I'm gonna ask the panel here, the media panel, each of you, please, I want you to ask one question which is essential for you to be answered so that you know how you want to vote, okay? So I want you to ask a question that will elicit the information that's going to make you know, now I know how to vote. But first, so what, think about that. Let's go to some questions from the audience. Thank you, sir. So the question is, um, when a child leaves the district, either because uh, he or she's moving or going to a charter school, that's one less student for the district to educate, to teach. So why is it considered draining money from the district if a, a student goes to a charter school? Mr. Deal, did you want to re address that? Thank you. Want me to address um, I mean, that's our I question. know you wouldn't want me okay. to answer. Okay, question. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm neutral. That's okay. All right, well, I'll, so, I'll, so I'll, I'll answer. So, so I, th I think all, pol all politics in this question is, is local. I think there are all kinds of circumstances. Let me give you one example of how this works. So in Franklin, Hampshire County, we have a number of elementary schools where there's one first grade teacher, one second grade teacher, one third grade teacher. So let's suppose two kids from that school, or five kids from that school go to a charter school. One goes from second grade, one goes from fourth grade, and so $50,000 goes from that school out. Now the school has no recourse. You can't cut a teacher, you can't close a classroom, you can't close the school. And so what does the school do? In the case I'm thinking of, the school cuts their reading teacher because that's all they've got left. And a couple of, year, a couple of years later, they have a greater special education population. So now their costs increase. So the point here, this particular example, is there's a lot of costs involved in districts that are fixed costs. I agree that the money following the student out should follow the student out, and I think school choice with $5,000 going out basically is that, is that the formula. But there's a lot of other fixed costs that follow a student out that then a district has to find some other way of absorbing and paying for. And that's where the, that's where the pain comes. 
Thank just a, a, a briefer way of saying that is uh, the, the, the money follows the child, but the costs don't. Uh, and, and, and to go to the point about how local this is, uh, this has real implications. What we're seeing across the Commonwealth is that schools are in that position where they're either losing a staff person and then class size is going up. We, it's, it is astonishing to me the number of d schools now that don't have librarians because, because that's, people are making really hard choices. The reason 187 school committees have s opposed question two is that they're the ones who are looking at these budgets. And they're the ones who every year are being forced to make decisions that they don't wanna have to make about cutting librarians, about cutting reading specialists, paraprofessionals. Those are the choices they don't wanna have to make. The same with the Mass Municipal Association, which is opposed to question two. They want to be able to provide the choice of a high quality public school. There are more students on the waiting list in Boston for first choice Boston schools okay. than there are on the waiting list for charter schools. And that's, but, we, but if we're losing $130 million a year, then they're not getting the choice of a high quality public school. That's where we have to make sure we're committed to that. Mr. Cannon, did you want to respond? Yeah, Barbara, yeah. I'm first I want to just, without going into details, you don't understand how the Boston selection system works and the waiting list at high quality Boston schools is, is, is a total myth. The, the point that we're raising here is about money. And the question was about how money follows the child and if one student leaves or two students leave, why is that a problem? What we haven't talked about yet is the reimbursement program that the state has for district schools who lose students to charter schools. So we talked about fixed costs. Bill talked about fixed costs. And you're right, Barbara also said, not all the costs of a student will leave with a student, right? We know that. There are fixed costs um, that are associated with a student. Generally, nationwide, you talk about 25% to 33% fixed costs is generally the ballpark that research shows that does not necessarily follow a child. So in Massachusetts, we have the most generous reimbursement program for charter schools, in the, for district schools who've lost students to charter schools in the country. So when a student leaves a charter school, the first year, the district is reimbursed 100% for that student. So a student leaves, and the district gets the full funding for that student. And the second year that student is gone, they get 25% of the value of that student, which is the fixed cost. They get that 25% for five years. So after a student leaves for six years, the district is getting reimbursement for that student, totaling 225% to help districts cover that cost. And Barbara's gonna say that district reimbursement program hasn't been fully funded wait, wait, every wait a minute. year. Now wait a minute, it's unfair to say what Barbara's gonna say <laughs> if she hasn't said it yet. But I'm not gonna let you say it anyway. Okay, I see also. <laughs> Okay. The, the let, me, let, me, let me finish my thought. Nope. Um, so when that, the district reimbursement program has not been fully funded by the legislature every year we've been here. But every year that reimbursement program has been funded, at least that first three years, the 100%, the 25% and the 25%. Sometimes okay. the state has not been able to fully fund the fourth and fifth and sixth year. You can decide for yourself as taxpayers who then have to pay twice for the student because you're reimbursing the district, whether or not this is a good investment for your money. Okay, we're going to go for uh, another uh, question from our audience, please. I want to be a chief. Friend of Tom and Jason Mosley, you have heard of the term boutique charter school to describe charter schools in our area. Please explain this term and the effect of these particular schools on the district public schools. Okay, so the question is about our area and our our um, boutique, so named boutique charter schools, and the question is, um, what effect does that have on the district? Is that what they're asking? What are, what, they what are boutique charter schools, and uh, what effect are they having on our local school districts? Well, we don't use the word boutique. I'm not sure where that, that, where, where that, um, um, that word came from. Let's talk just a little bit about the Pioneer Valley and the Charles, even though we don't think this has any relevance to the ballot question in hand, we know we live out here. And as someone who has sent their children to three different area charter schools, we can talk about that. 
I think the Valley is very blessed and parents are very blessed by the choices we have. So the schools in Western Massachusetts, at least up here in the, the Northern Valley, um, when you call it boutique, we might call it a little bit like niche schools. So we have the Pioneer Valley Performing Arts Charter High School, which is a performing arts school. We have the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School, which immerses, which immerses children in Chinese starting in kindergarten. We have the Four Rivers Charter Public School in Greenfield, which is an expeditionary learning school which practices outside the classroom education. We have the Hilltown Cooperative Charter Public School in East Hampton, which practices the Reggio Emilia theory of education um, from Italy. So we have schools that are, have particular missions and particular foci for parents who want them. Not every parent wants to send their kids to a performing arts high school, and certainly not every parent wants to send their kid to a Chinese immersion. But the choices that those schools bring to a community make the community richer, and it makes it more diverse and it brings more educational options. So I would, if you look at the funding levels in Western Mass of the school districts, there has not been a drop in funding because of charter schools. Our schools in Western Mass are thriving. And so the added choice and options that these couple of charter schools provide for parents, we feel is really, really beneficial, not just to the parents, but to the entire community. Uh, Three quick points. Point one, Amherst, $1.4 million a year. Belchertown, 500,000. Hadley, small Hadley, 500,000. East Hampton, almost 1 million. Holyoke, almost 10 million. Northampton, 2.2 million. That's the funds lost to charter schools this year in each of those districts. Uh, two interesting studies. One, the Gazette had a story about Northampton, uh, who from North Parent, Northampton is going to charter schools? And uh, Chris Capucci on the school committee and uh, or the, the Democratic committee in East Hampton did a study as well in East Hampton. What we found is that it's creating a two-tiered economic system, that the families that are sending their students to charter schools are upper middle class families. And I was at the Democratic uh, town meeting uh, in, in East Hampton where it got rather heated because the, the people who've lived and grown up in East Hampton were pretty offended that uh, people were coming into East Hampton gentrifying and then taking the money out of the East Hampton schools uh, to send their children to uh, charter schools. Okay. Last piece of information about that, we have a Chinese immersion charter school, but East Hampton no longer has middle school language programs. That's not a choice. So. Okay, 30, 30, 30 seconds, seconds. Mahia, I'm going to use ahead. my 30 seconds. So I want to go back to, I would like to see, instead of saying um, taking and losing more as an investment in terms of how we, we classify that language, is like really investing in public education. But I believe, and I have to say as someone who lives in Boston, is that we already have a two-tier system, and that is constituted by your zip code and where you happen to live. If you have money and you have the opportunity and wealth to live in certain neighborhoods, then you are pricing us out and therefore you are creating your own type of private schools. Okay. So there are already existing two tier systems and that is called your size of your budget and your wallet. Okay, we're gonna go for uh, one more. Uh, you got a Twitter question there? Or a question that, uh, okay, you got a question. Go ahead, we're gonna have one more and then we're gonna have rapid fire from the panel. The thing they most need to know in order to be able to vote. <laughs> the first purpose of charter schools is to, quote, stimulate the development of innovative programs within public education. Uh, please describe several such innovative programs that have been successfully shared with public school boards. So the entire city of Lawrence. Okay, wait a minute, I just have to uh, repeat oh, this sorry. briefly. That, uh, we sort of talked about this before, but um, I guess we can do it again here. Um, the issue is, thank you, uh, that under Chapter 12, one of the missions of charter schools was to stimulate innovation, which would then be bleeding over into uh, public schools. So uh, could we talk about several of those cases? Go ahead, Mr. Deal. Oh, it was Mr. Cannon. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Eileen. Um, The, first of all, the innovations that charter schools have developed have been very difficult to share with district schools because district schools close their doors to us. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk to us. 
They view us as a hostile competition, and so we can't get into many district schools, and those of you who work in district schools know that to be true. But more importantly, the innovation of charter schools have taken a different form, and it's about how to structure a public school. And so in the city of Lawrence, and the city of Holyoke have both been taken over by the state because they are a dramatically failing district. They're level five districts and they're taken over by the state. The state then appointed receivers to those communities to manage those districts and they, those receivers have implemented the basic governance structure of charter schools within their districts. So they're trying to grant their schools the charter school model of increased autonomy in exchange for increased accountability. And in Lawrence, we're starting to see some really good record, really good results from that. So this is a great example. Holyoke's now doing the same thing about how the experiment and the research and the innovations of charter schools are not just being transferred from one school to another, but are implementing, being implemented across whole urban school districts across the state. And that we feel is the most profound innovation and sharing that we could possibly do. Okay, Ms. Madeline. Ms. I, mean, I think we've already discussed this at length, non-compete clauses. Uh, there was actually a really good um, article by one of the architects of the 1993 ed reform in the Medford uh, uh, Daily Paper, uh, talking about how, in fact, uh, innovation has is not been a part of what charter schools uh, have, have brought to us. And this isn't about district schools. This is about uh, the, the charter schools uh, have not been interested in sharing. What's happened is that the idea of 25 charter schools that could innovate has been corrupted to the idea that we're going to explode charter schools and have them be everywhere. And, the, and you've heard it in the language uh, today uh, from speakers from the other side, the, the profound disrespect uh, for the working people in our public schools uh, it ha has kept us uh, from being able to say, like, how are we going to work together? This has become something, and this ballot question represents it in a profound way. Uh, if you want to talk about divisive, say you're going to blow up the public schools and then pretend that you're not, and then be so disrespectful to the people who do this work every day. I, I don't know how to innovate from that. I want to innovate from a real collaboration. Okay, we're going to go now rapid fire from our uh, panel here. The question that you need to have answered so that you'll know how to vote. Go ahead, starting right with you. As more charters okay. open, how will the schools deal with the question of busing students that are out of district? And who did you want to address that question to? Um, I think Mark, maybe? Is that, is that your school? Sure. Uh, okay. Um, um, under state law, a district is responsible for busing students to a charter school that are within the city or town that that charter school resides. So the Chinese Immersion Charter School in Hadley, town of Hadley only has to bus kids from Hadley into the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School. Beyond that, the schools have to provide the busing, and they do in many cases, some they don't, um, to the families, and that's a, at their own cost. Okay, thanks. We'll get another question here, Serena. charter school failures. Okay, who wants to hit that? I, I just think this question uh, addresses the, the whole sort of destabilizing impact of, of charter schools. The, the idea of, of public education is that we, we as taxpayers, uh, no, and, and no matter whether we have children or not, I mean, it's the great loving thing we do to say as a community, we are all gonna contribute uh, to, to, to the lives of our children and the future of our children, uh, and, and we're gonna do that together. And it matters that there be stability in that. That's an, an, a very important part of, of children's lives. Both the uh, district takeovers uh, and, and the charterization of schools, the idea of a school can just open and close willy-nilly. We've seen that happen in New Orleans. Uh, where I was talking before with the high percentage of charter schools there. Schools just close, and then kids don't have a place to go. Uh, that isn't what we want. We need a deep, profound structure for every child where they're gonna be welcome. And the real issue is, are willing, we willing, as a commonwealth, to commit to that and pay for that so that every child has the choice of a high-quality public school, not a private school paid for with public money? Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Slish, go ahead. Um, 
I'm concerned about money and politics and the money involved in this ballot question. I, we've heard from Mr. Kennan, but I'd like to hear from, as a mother, um, how you feel about, or if you're skeptical of p possible motives of behind big dollar donations. So I, I first want to apologize if I have come across disrespectful, but like I said, this for me is very personal and professional. Um, so I'm sorry, Barbara, that you have felt disrespected. My mom is a low-wage worker, and had she had a union, maybe she would be able to retire now at 67. Um, but unfortunately, she didn't have the level of education, so she couldn't. So to answer your question, as a mother, and this is what I said in the beginning, for me, I find the money conversation to be disempowering, and um, I struggle with that. So coming here, feels like we're asking for things that we should have a right to. And I don't really care where the money comes from. As long as my kids have access to a quality education, I don't care. And I know that sounds elitist, but you have to understand, being the first person in my family to graduate high school is a big to-do. And I'm not here only representing myself. There are a lot of other families who right now can care less what kind of governance structure it is. But we have been forced to choose between one and the other when we know that at the end of the day, this conversation is a recycle of something that happened 60 or 70 years ago, and we're still trying to fight for a little bit of the crumbs. So if we have, I don't care. I, I know this sounds crazy, and I'll say, y'all can YouTube me later. Um, but you know what, if they have money, I have no problem taking from those who have and creating opportunities for those who don't. And if that considers me to be selfish, then by God, by all means, I am selfish. Because I wanna make sure that they, those millionaires that got it, that they put it back into the communities because that's where it belongs. Okay. And that's all I gotta say. All right, now we get a question from Mr. Moulton, go ahead. The question you need to have answered before you know how to vote. Well. <clears throat> We've heard time and again how complex this is. Uh, we've heard it described as an urban issue, not one for the Pioneer Valley, yet it's a statewide ballot question. How, 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 why is this on the ballot? Why is this not a better issue for the legislature to sort out? Well, I think we answered that earlier, that we tried. We tried desperately over the last four years in the legislature to reach some kind of compromise that would lead to being able to provide more opportunities, and we were met with a wall of resistance from the, who now they know on two forces. This does belong in the legislature. And to be honest with you, it was a failure of the legislature to act. And um, we've made that clear to them as well. So they are guilty here. But what are our choices at that point? So the legislature has refused to do this. The union has blocked any kind of compromise from us being able to reach. So the only choice we had was about a referendum. We don't, we'd rather not do this, it's not fun. Um, and um, it's very stressful and creates a lot of tension, um, as Barbara has indicated. But the needs of these families in our urban school district is paramount. And so no matter how stressful or difficult this conversation is, it's nowhere near as difficult or as stressful as a situation that many families are incurring every day in our urban communities. So it is unusual to have a statewide ballot question that's really focused on some small subset of communities. And so people ask me in the suburbs as I go around the state talking about this, well, why should I vote for this? And I said, well, because kids are kids. Kids are kids if they're black or brown or they're Asian or they're white, and if they're urban communities or suburban communities. And I would hope all of you would care enough about what's happening outside of Amherst and outside of the Western Mass to be able to take a stand and vote yes on behalf of kids and families. I'd like to be able to take a shot at that as well. I would invite you all to Google Mark's name uh, with the RISE Act, uh, which the Senate passed. Uh, don't remember the exact time. Uh, when that was, uh, but just last year, which would have allowed for an increase in a slow increase in charter schools relative to increases in the foundation budget and had with it accountability measures for charter schools. And you can find the quotes from Mark himself saying how outrageous it was that there were gonna be accountability measures attached to this act. So we have to be really clear here about, about who's blocking what. Um, I, I also wanna really say very clearly, in terms of issues of transparency and honesty, once again, read the ballot question. 
12 charter schools anywhere in Massachusetts, the only time that it matters that it is the bottom 25% is if there are more than 12 applications. So if there are 16 applications and six of those are in the bottom 25%, then yeah, those might get priority, but six more don't. And 230 districts already feel the impact of charter schools. The idea that this is just an urban thing is, is just not true. 187 school districts, school committees have said, this is bad for our schools. You're gonna take them seriously? They know what these budgets mean. Okay, we're gonna take now one question. Let me just, I'm gonna take one question that you know, really, the panel should address. It's so important. And then, okay, and then I'm gonna ask uh, very quickly, you, right, there's the clock. Very quickly, each person on the panel to say one thing that you feel people here should know before they vote. Okay, go ahead. Can you report on reimbursement figures in all the districts that is having lost funds to charter schools? That's a lot of districts. Uh, can you report on all the districts having That's lost question. having no. lost money? No, no, you can't. No, no actually, actually, if you if you <laughs> no. go to actually no, if you go to Mass <laughs> districts, they can't no, report. We can't report on it right now, but if you go to MassTeacher.org, uh, there's a map on our page that you click on it, and then you can click on your district and you can either click on your district and see how much money is lost, or there's a PDF uh, that you can click on and you can actually get all of them. Uh, and this is money, this, these are uh, statistics that we get from looking at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, figures. That's how you can get that. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna give the panel just two seconds to uh, think of the seconds. thing that they need to uh, say that's most important for all of us to hear so we know how to vote. <coughs> um, and while they think about that, I just wanna say to thank you to everyone who attended tonight and to all our sponsors. God bless them, and boy, it is great to live in a democracy, even though it's hard sometimes. Okay, all right, who wants to start with the one thing you think people really need to know so they know how to cast their ballot? Mr. Deal, go right ahead. Uh, since I'm the lowest in the alphabet, I'll, I can start. <laughs> so I, first, I want, I, first of all, I want to really honor my colleagues to the right in a couple of statements they made. Mark referenced a very, very important study by Tom Herrer that pointed out the fact that a disproportionate number of, of uh, low income, uh, kids of color and so on are identified as special needs students. That's a very major problem. We're the third worst in the nation that way. We also have significant in in uh, gaps in terms of achievement and opportunity for our inner city youth. That's a really major issue. The question of this ballot really about is whether or not charter schools is the solution to that. And I'm not sure about that. And I think you people in the audience, I'm not gonna tell you how I vote or how I think you should vote, but I think you really have to weigh all the different opinions here, but also whether or not charter schools are or aren't the solution to the issues we're facing. Okay. Ms. Mejia, are you ready? But and I have a breakdown here, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. So yeah, this is a very vulnerable opportunity for me. Um, I, I, I think that it's really important for us as voters to recognize what the larger picture is here. And when you think about the money, think outside the box when it comes to the money. Because when we look at how much money has been spent on educating kids, who when they get to high school still can't read and write, and think about that loss, and think about those lives, and think about the workforce that we have created. So when you think about kids, and, and I worked with women who were transitioning out of the Department of Transitional Service, which is welfare. These are what we're producing, if we don't step up our game, we're producing, in terms of communities of color and low income, the next set of janitors, low wage workers, if we don't really look at this conversation around public education. And for me, it's about all, and all means all. And just because I am pro-charter does not necessarily mean I'm anti-district or I am anti-union. What I am is anti-social discrepancies that continue to disregard low-income communities. And so for me, this conversation is and will always be about giving me a choice as a parent to decide what is best for my child and my children to 
to be able to make that informed decision based on what I believe, not what, what either one system is telling me. And, and, and Barbara, I have to, one last thing that I would say, this is my first time in this space with you, but when I first started doing advocacy work, it has been the most hostile environment for me to be a woman of color and stand here in front of people who think that I am anti-union is so, disempowering because all I want is what's best for all of our kids. Okay. And I don't want to have to feel bullied about that either. Okay, I'm gonna cut you, cut you off here, but thank you for that statement. Now we got uh, two people left. Go ahead, Mark. No, we're alternating, I think. No, so. no go ahead. <laughs> all right, wait, 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 I'll give Barbara the last word. Um, we, we get to do this often. We're gonna do it again, I think, on Monday um, in Framingham. So you can have the last you word get it, tonight. You get it, Framingham. Um, Don't forget now, okay. Okay. Um, you know, I think that what Bill said earlier, which I think is the most important thing of the evening, is that we have the best education system in the country and the third highest achievement gaps. Achievement gaps need to be personalized. That means black and brown students, low-income students, ELL students, special education students. So there's something that's totally unacceptable about that paradigm that we have the best education system. We have the best education system for white majority students. We're leaving thousands and thousands of students behind. So I ask you as voters to think about, are you willing to take a step to help deal with some of the inequality in this country? It's a small step to be able to vote yes on question two, but how often do we have an opportunity to take that small step as individuals to help others who don't have as much or the same opportunities as we have. Charter schools are not perfect. The system is not perfect. The ballot question is not perfect. But think about what happens if no on two wins. Nothing. Nothing changes. And whether you're a fan of Bernie Sanders, you're a fan of Elizabeth Warren, whoever you're a fan of, economic inequality comes from education inequality. If we're not willing to address that in this state, we will continue to have that inequality and it will grow and grow. And I have to say, it's primarily it's a class issue and it's a race issue. And we have to be willing to confront that. It's not okay to have the best system in the world and leave so many children behind. Thank you, Mr. Kennan. Okay, Ms. Madaloni. So I became short a, statement. I, Here we go. Yeah, I, I <laughs> short. Huh? Uh, you know, I, I guess I would go back to how I started. Uh, this is about public education, and this is about public education as something that we together decide we will all contribute to. People contribute to public education uh, who don't have children in schools. As a matter of fact, we'd be in big trouble if the only people who contributed to public education were the people who had kids in school. It's a, it's a broader commitment that we've made. Uh, and, and, and this ballot question would, would undermine that. It wouldn't create more equality. It would create more inequality. It would, it would create a two, it, it already is a two-tiered system. I talked to you about the class differential here in the Valley. We see, it's interesting when Mark talks about race, because one of the, see, up in, up in Fitchburg, the charter school has more white kids. And what the Fitchburg teachers will tell you is the charter school is the white flight place that people are going in Fitchburg to get away from the recent immigrants in that community. The commitment that we have to make is to figuring out how we as a country steeped in racism, grown out of slavery, is gonna figure out how we're gonna work together for all of our children. Not by creating separate systems. Not by saying one person's individual choice trumps other choices. But by saying we are deeply committed to each other and we're gonna figure out how to do that. We're gonna work on this as we've been trying to work on it frequently unsuccessfully, but we have to live to that ideal. Not say, well, we can't have our ideal, so we're each gonna go off and take all our own piece of the pie. Let's live to the vision of public education in a democracy, vote no on two, and then there is something we're gonna do afterwards. We're gonna get that foundation budget paid for, which the state said we're already underfunding this, uh, public schools by more than a billion dollars. The legislator ignored that when we said we need a billion dollars more, 
and we're gonna move the fair share amendment, and we're gonna tax the rich, and we're gonna pay for our public schools with that. Thank you, all right. Bread and roses for all, that's what I say. <laughs> thank you, I wanna say thank you very, very much to uh, our panelists. Uh, thank you, I deeply appreciate you coming out tonight and speaking to this. It's not easy. I also wanna thank our, our media folks, uh, Kelsey Kenny and Serena McMahon from UMass, uh, Stephanie Schlisch from WHMP, okay. and Stan Moulton from the Gazette. And thanks to the journalism department here at UMass. I believe that early voting starts on Monday, but if you don't want to go early voting, November 8th, that's your day. Thanks and good night. <laughs>